Get your Bibles out or your phones to take notes. You can start Facebook and stuff as we're going live if you want to. I, I'm, I don't care. Uh, let's just get the word out. How many of you guys want to, I, I just like to say it this way, just kick the devil in the teeth tonight. Let's just do that, okay? So we're going to do that in this new series called Break the Mold. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your power and your presence in our life. And we don't want to stay where we are. And so, Lord, I thank you so much that we're not just dependent upon our own strength, but we can walk in your power, in your freedom. And I declare that out loud right now in the name of Jesus tonight. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, uh, or maybe that's 12. I've got, maybe that's 12. I I don't know. It's been a long week, guys. Okay, let me just, (laughs) I'm going to read this scripture, okay? But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved, among those who are perishing. Do you you ever think about, I think about this in weird ways. What do you smell like? (laughs) I, I mean to God. See, we are the aroma, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. Now, that's a very interesting scripture right there. What's the aroma? What kind of aroma do we carry? And and I think a lot of that aroma happens by how we see ourselves in life, by by what we allow ourselves, what culture comes in our life. How many of you guys know, you ever met somebody that it seems like everywhere they go, there's conflict. Have you guys know what I'm talking about? Everywhere they go, no matter what situation, no matter what church, no matter what uh, relationship, no matter what job, there's conflict. How many of you guys know somebody like that? If you don't know somebody like that, you're that person, okay? <laughs> you just are, okay? Just know it. Everybody else knows it. You just don't know it. Uh, but everywhere you go, listen, if everywhere you go, there is conflict. If everywhere you go, there's a problem. The com- common denominator is not everywhere. Does anybody follow me? The common denominator is you. It's because there's an aroma that you carry, and it may be negative, it may be positive, it may be Christ-like, it may not be. And so we carry an aroma around us, and so many times we get stuck in a certain place in life. And we just think, well, this is just the way that I am. This is just who I am. This is just how I, this is what my personality is. This is just how, this is how I grew up. You know, I, I'm this, this heritage or that heritage, or this is my family, or that came from my family. And we get stuck with a lid on our life. How many of you guys have ever felt stuck with a lid on your life before? That, two people over here. Okay, we'll just preach over this direction then. All right. I, I've been there, and, I've, I, and you kind of settle in to whatever that is. Now, you might say, well, okay, so who cares if I've got a lid on my life? Who cares if I just, you know, if I'm stuck in a certain area, if it's only, you know, if maybe I won't experience all the good things I could, maybe I won't have as good of relationships as I could, you know, and if, if that's where you're at, listen, you're not just lazy, you lack love. And, and I say that strong because if you think your lid is only about you, You've missed the point of the gospel. See, God wants us to break the mold that we're currently living in. He wants us to lift the lid. And it's not just about whether we experience everything we want to in life or not. It's about how we affect other people. You say, well, what's what's at stake? If I don't lift the lid, if I don't break the mold of my current situation, my current hindrances, what's at stake? Well, it's much more than just your experiences. I'll tell you what's at stake. If we don't lift the lid in our life, if we don't reach the potential calling of God in our life, I can tell you, if people don't lift the lid in their life, churches won't get planted, co-workers won't get saved, families will live mediocre lives, and kids will go on in families who live mediocre lives and go off to college and turn away from Christ. It happens all the time. You'll have orphans that won't get adopted. I mean, uh, uh, we all know that I'm not over-dramatizing this when I say if we don't reach our full potential, there's something at stake. How many of you guys want to break the mold that you're currently in? Who, I, I don't want to stay where I'm at. I don't want to just stay with the current lid that I have. I don't want to live with my lid. Listen, if Moses would have stuck where he was at, he had a stuttering lid. He thought, man, I can't talk to people. And and so if he would have just stayed there, guess what? The whole people of God would have stayed stuck as slaves in Egypt. 
But he decided, I'm going to break the mold. I'm going to lift the lid. I'm going to follow after God's ways. So here's our key scripture. Okay, write this down. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. How many of you guys want to live free? And I don't just mean free. I'm talking about to the fullest freedom. See, you weren't set free just to be a slave. You weren't set free just to have a lid. You weren't set free to be stuck in a certain mold of this world. You were set free to live free and to free other people. But you don't get there living with your lid. And so tonight, we've got we've to do some uncomfortable things tonight, okay? We've got to roll up our sleeves and go to work tonight. And, I, and I'm telling you, if we let Jesus work on us and we roll up our sleeves and we begin to go to, to work after he's empowered us with his grace, then I believe some lids are popping off and I believe some molds are getting broken tonight. Does anybody want to live more free tonight? Here, here's the problem. A lot of people don't understand this, but God created you without a lid. You realize that? That God's power is limitless. God created you without a lid. Now, here's the problem. Here's what happens. I just kind of saw this this week as I was thinking about this. Here's what happens. God created us without a lid, but we start making our own lid. And we might, might have a little bit of failure come in our life, and so we just put a piece of, uh, of lid right over that. We might have a bad conversation with somebody, and we put a lid there. We might have an offense come on there, and we put a lid. We might have a bad church experience come on there, and, and we, we put a little bit more of a lid on. And before we know it, pretty soon, there's a lid that God never intended to be on there. God didn't create us with a lid. And so, so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to hopefully rip off some of the lid that other people have put on us, that we've put on ourselves, and get free, more free in Christ. And so we're going to look at a few thoughts on how to break the mold, how to lift the lid. And I want to do it by looking at the life of Jacob and Esau in the Bible. Jacob and Esau, it's a fascinating story all throughout, really through a bulk of the, the book of Genesis. And so uh, let's watch as we look at the story of Jacob and Esau. Let's watch. So I've been out hunting a lot lately, and, and it really reminded me of this story in Genesis chapter 25. And it starts off with a mom who has twins, and the, the first one comes out, and then the second one comes out grabbing the firstborn's heel. And so it kind of starts this war between brothers, this sibling rivalry that happens throughout and starts to play out throughout Genesis. And so Esau is the firstborn and he grows up and he becomes more of an outdoorsman. He likes hunting. He likes all those types of things. And Jacob, he becomes more of an office job type guy. He likes the inside. And and so there's this famous story that happens in Genesis 25. Esau has been out hunting for a long time. The Bible doesn't tell us how how long he's been out hunting, but it does say that he came back and he was so hungry, he felt like he was going to die. I mean, he's like so starving. He's been out hunting for a long time. He comes back and there's Jacob. He's making this big old bowl of stew. And I'm sure Esau could smell it like a mile away. And he comes back in, he's starving. And he says, Jacob, let me have some of that stew. And Jacob says, no, this is my stew. He says, no, I'm about to die. Let me have some of the stew. And so Jacob has an idea. And he says, well, why don't you sell me your birthright? Trade me your birthright for a bowl of soup. And the, the birthright in ancient Israel was a big deal. It meant when the father passed away that the firstborn son would get a lot of stuff. It would get like double the property. I mean, it was a big, big deal. And so Jacob says, well, sell me that. Trade me that for this bowl of soup. And finally, Esau comes to this conclusion. He's like... I'm about ready to die. If I don't eat something, what good is my birthright to me? And so he's like, fine, whatever. And they spit, shake hands on it, whatever they do. And they make a deal. And for a bowl of soup, Esau trades the birthright. What would cause Esau to trade something of so much value for something of so little value? And the answer really comes in one word, and it's the word convenience. You see, we'll do a lot of crazy things for convenience. That's why you can go up to the grocery store, you can get all your shopping done, you get in line, and all of a sudden there's this magazine uh, on the, the rack of like aliens abducting celebrities. And it's like, normally you would never buy that, but here you are, you're standing in line, and so people just like, well, let's, let's just buy that. And so they know that because of convenience uh, that they can get you to do something you normally wouldn't do otherwise. Listen, Satan knows this too. And so for convenience, many times we'll surrender things in our life, we'll surrender surrender our voice in our kids' life. We'll surrender our calling. We'll, we'll do all kinds of things. We'll, we'll stay in the shallow end of things of God just because of convenience. 
And so here's break the mold thought number one. Be careful what you surrender for the sake of convenience. Some things we're typically uh, leaning to surrender are things like our integrity because of convenience. Things like our identity because of convenience. Things like our influence because of convenience. You see, Jacob didn't steal uh, Esau's birthright. The Bible says that he basically surrendered it. He despised the birthright. And Esau had inverted values, something that was of so little value in the long term, like a bowl of soup, became of immense value in the now. And something that had great value long term, all of a sudden had very little value to him now. And so it was easy for him to surrender for the sake of convenience. So the question today, it's not what are you surrendering for God? It's really what from God are you surrendering? Be careful what you surrender for the sake of convenience. And when we surrender things like that, guess what happens? The lid, it keeps coming on us. It's like laying on another layer of the lid. Be careful what you surrender for the sake of convenience. Do you realize that history, according to ancient Israel and the way things work, history, you hear all the time, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you realize it was supposed to be Abraham, Isaac, and Esau? Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? What changed there? Say what you want about Jacob acquiring the birthright. You can say he stole the birthright. You know what it seemed like? It didn't seem like God minded that much. Because God allowed it for all history to be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and, and I just wanted to get this out there tonight because some of you feel like, a, and I, I'm going to say this, it's going to sound weird, but some of you guys will kind of get what I'm saying. You feel like a second born. You feel like you're maybe not quite coming, measuring up or you don't have quite the advantage that other people have. Or you might, you might feel behind the eight ball. You might feel behind the game. But I, w- I just want you to know that we serve a God. We serve a God. A, a, a sec- you may be a second born type person, but you can still have first born blessings type of God. And somebody needs to have that deep-seated in your heart right now because you've taken on a victim identity. You've taken on an identity of somebody who's less than, somebody who's not enough, somebody who's always coming in last, who's always coming in second, and is always coming up short. No, that is not the God that we serve. You don't have to be a victim to where you are. You don't have to stay with the lid. Again, our key scripture, Galatians 5, verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Some of us are surrendering God possibilities because we're embracing, we're not embracing freedom, we're embracing fatalism. We're embracing this idea that what will be is what will be. We're embracing this idea that this is kind of just the way that God has it set up. And you might say, well, God is sovereign. And since God is sovereign, everything's just kind of playing out the way it's going to play out. And everything must be, it's all predecided. You know, some are predestined for heaven, some are predestined for hell. God's already decided all of this stuff. Listen, everything that we get locked into, it continues to create this lid. Like, I'm just a victim to the whole circumstance. God is sovereign, so whatever happens must be God's will. Let me tell you, that is a dangerous line of thinking. This whatever happens must have been God's will line of thinking is a dangerous line of thinking. Uh, and, And let me tell you why. You know, and, and not just for some of the theology nerds want to put on their theology nerd glasses for just a second. We could talk about predestination. We could talk about all sorts of things. Some of you guys can just check out right now. The others of you guys want to lean in. Uh, let me just give you some of my thoughts on that. Predestination describes, really it describes the provisions that God makes. It doesn't, it, it's, it's not like he's decided everything that will happen. Everything that's happening is not what God has predecided to happen. And there's a difference between pre, what God has predestined and what God has foreknowledge of. In other words, there's, you know, God sees the end from the beginning, the whole timeline of all history. As far as God is concerned, whatever is going to happen has already happened. Okay, it's, it's because God exists outside of time, right? And so just because God has foreknowledge of something from our perspective does not mean he caused it. Am I preaching to the right crowd or maybe I'm preaching to the wrong crowd? Okay, I don't know if I'm in the right church or not. But, And here's the thing. Just because God knows it will happen doesn't mean he's making it happen. We have to be careful with this. Whatever happens must be God's will thinking. Because so many times we fall into this. How many of you guys have done this before? Okay, God, 
uh, I'm praying for a job, and if I get the job, that must be your will. But if I don't get, get the job, that must be your will. How many of you guys have ever been there before? All right, me and three people. Four, five, okay. That sounds fine on a job level, but what happens if we play that out in every other level of our life, in every other area, that whatever happens must have been God's will? What happens when it starts impugning things like God's character? Listen, here's the thing. We have to understand this. Everything that happens in this world is not what God wants to happen. You see, if God had predecided everything, then everything that happens would be what God wants. But everything that happens in this world is not happening the way God wants it to happen. God didn't want sin to happen, and yet sin happened. Okay? So God hasn't, pre- he hasn't laid down all the tracks and everything's running on it and he just kind of let it run. That's not how it works. You know, because then you get into to, to loss in your life and you think, well, it must, and you've got to try to somehow theologically fit that into a category that, that makes sense. And sometimes we just have to say, you know what? God didn't want that to happen either. Why? Because he gave us free choice. In order for real love to happen, there has to be a choice. God didn't create robots. In order for real love to happen, there has to be a real choice. I have to be able to really love. God can't, I can't make my kids love me. God can't make us love him. It doesn't matter how much grace we get poured out on us. The Bible still says that you can receive grace in vain. And and so uh, we have to get this down deep in us. The reason why is because God also created us for freedom. And for freedom to be real, then there has to actually be real choices that we can make. And the reason I'm laying these tracks down for us is because some of us feel like everything has been predecided for us in life, and we begin to take a fatalistic uh, attitude towards whatever happens to us in life. And so if something bad happens, we're just like, well, okay, I, this must have been God, it's God's will, and he's going to use it for good in my life, and it must be he knows better than I, his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And we begin to become a victim to whatever happens instead of understanding that, co- that Jesus created us, that God created us for freedom. And if there's freedom, that means we're not predestined to whatever happens to our life. We have a part to play in this. And so I love this quote that I heard. It was, it was a guy who uh, lived a, a while ago, and he was like into wildlife and conservationism or something like that. But he said this. He said, to what avail are 40 freedoms if there are no blank space on the map? In other words, if there's nowhere to use our freedom, then what good is freedom? I want us to understand tonight that God created us for freedom. And for freedom to be real, that means we have a part to play in it. That means we have choices that we can make. That means we aren't victims of our lid. That means that everything that happens in our life is not somehow ordained by God. That there are some things in our life that happen that God didn't want to happen either. And because of that, we've got to continue to understand and exercise and walk in freedom. I got one person amen to me over here. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> the rest of you are free to leave. Uh, it's just the way God said it. I mean, I just set it up that way. Here's the good news. You have options. No matter where you're at right now, no matter what's happened to you at this point, You don't have to just play out and continue to be in the same mold that you've been in. Jesus has given us freedom. It was for freedom that he set us free. And no matter where you're at tonight, no matter what's happened to you tonight, everything that's happened in your life is not what God has wanted to happen. But I tell you what, there's power in Jesus' name for us to turn the thing around, for us to step into a new level of freedom. And so to do that, we got to understand a little bit of the why behind this. And to do that, we got to continue the story of Jacob and Esau. So let's watch. So there's another famous story about Jacob and Esau in the Bible. And Esau being the firstborn, even though he's already sold off his birthright, there's something else that being the firstborn, you would get as being the firstborn. And and when the father, the patriarch, would be ready to pass away, he would bestow a blessing upon the firstborn. And so Isaac, Jacob and Esau's father, says, man, it's about time for me to go. He was basically blind. 
he calls in Esau and he knows his days are numbered. And so he, he says, Esau, I want you to go out and I want you to go kill one of your famous game, game meals and bring it back for me one last time. And so Esau gets all of his gear gathered up. He goes out hunting. And so Isaac and Rebekah, the, the parents, Isaac really had his favorite and it was Esau. And Rebekah had her favorite and it was Jacob. And so Rebekah overhears all of this and she really wants Jacob to get the blessing. Even though he's already got the birthright, she wants him to get the blessing as well. And so she, she devises a plan. She says, Jacob, why don't you go and make one of your famous meals and bring it into your father so you can get the blessing? And Jacob says, but I'm, remember, I'm office guy. He's outdoors guy. He smells different than I do. He's all hairy and I'm really smooth skin. And so she comes up with a plan to put on Esau's clothes for him and to put some fur on his hands so he feels a little more hairy like Esau does. And sure enough, he goes off and makes his meal and brings it into the father. And, and the father's getting ready to bestow a blessing. But he says, are you sure you're Esau? You sound like Jacob. And so he goes over to him and he can't see, but he can feel, okay, you feel like Esau, you smell like Esau. And so he commands a blessing over Jacob. And no sooner the Jacob walks out, Esau comes back in with, with his meal. And, and the father says, wait a minute, I just blessed somebody. Who did I bless? And, and they finally figure it out that Jacob had, had tricked them. And, and here in this moment, uh, finally Esau realized that he had lost who he was supposed to become. And this is break the mold thought number two. Who you're becoming is more important than what you're doing. Who you're becoming is more important than what you're doing. You know, when I, I used to be on staff at a large church, I was a youth pastor of several hundred teenagers. And when I left that position, I had an opportunity to go in and work even at a bigger church. I mean, it was, if I were to tell you the name, it's, it's one of the fastest growing uh, in, in the nation. And as I was considering that, I decided not to even consider it. And it's because even though I'd have an opportunity to do a lot of amazing things, to do a lot of cool stuff, who I'd have to become to do that, to be a part of that environment, was not worth it. Because who I'm becoming is more important than what I'm doing. There's a famous quote that I like, uh, that I've said a lot of times, and it's this, you can teach what you know, but you reproduce who you really are. You can teach what you know, but you reproduce who you really are. See, who we're becoming is more important than what we're doing. The world gets this all wrong. And usually, and a lot of us, we get it wrong too. We, we end up allowing what we're doing to turn us into who we are. Instead of deciding that who we become should decide, who we're becoming should decide what we're doing. See, we've got to switch it back around. If we want to break the mold, we have to go away from the world's ways that says what I do turns me into who I am. And we've got to decide who do I want to be? Some of you are at a fork in the road in life right now, and you're trying to decide between A and B. And it's not what do I get to do? What awesome things do I get to do if I do A or B? It's really what kind of person do I become if I go down this path over this path? Who we are becoming is more important than what we're doing. So Esau goes out hunting. He loses his birthright. He goes out hunting. He loses his blessing. I'm thinking, what does Esau's wife think about this? Esau, every time you go out hunting, something bad happens. Stop going out hunting. <laughs> and this could be a biblical case for wives who don't want their husbands to go out hunting. I hope that's not the case, but... But I just thought that was kind of funny. Uh, who you are becoming is more important than what you are doing. Listen, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to reimagine our life for just a little bit. We're going to reimagine our life because we're not a victim of what's happened. We're not a victim of everything being predecided. We are going to reimagine our life tonight with the help of the Holy Spirit. And, and I just want you to think about this. Uh, some of us feel stuck maybe in our job. We feel stuck in our career. We feel stuck in our family situation. Whatever it is, we, we feel stuck right now. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can imagine a brand new way of thinking, a brand new life. I was thinking about my, my brother, Jake. I was out hunting with him this week, and he didn't steal anything from me, by the way. Um, but I was out, out hunting with him this week, but uh, he's a police officer. And he has a, a skill set of, of learning self-defense and all these types of things. And like, what do, what do I do? How do I use this for the kingdom of God? And there's obvious things to be able to, to you know, minister to people wherever he's at. But God also 
caused him to have an idea to break out of the mold of the typical thing of where he was at. And God gave him a creative idea. And he began to link up with missionaries and, and to begin to go out on the mission field and begin to train pastors in, in situational awareness and be able to train them in dangerous parts of the world where they're having to you know, be in underground churches and all sorts of things. And so he's been basically in the last couple of years, basically all over the world, helping pastors and local pastors, being able to train them through a unique skill set that I don't have and most of us don't have. God gave him a creative way to reimagine how he could use his life for the kingdom of God. And so tonight, I believe that God can give us those ideas, that God can give us ideas just like that. Francis Chan asked a question uh, one time, and he, I thought it was a brilliant question. He asked this question. If God had his way, what would the church look like? I mean, if God had his way, what would the church look like? I thought that was an awesome question. Now, let me just personalize this for us this evening. If God had his way, and this is break the mold thought, number three. If God had his way, what would your life look like? Yeah, but, but, but what about, no, I'm saying if God had his way, if you can just take off the lid for just a little bit, if God had his way in, his, in your life, what would your life look like? What things would be different? If you add the God, if God had his way, reimagine it through the eye of faith. Rip off the duct tape just a little bit more tonight. Because here's what I want you to understand. God's will is always possible. There are some things that God says, hey, this is possible. Just because it's possible doesn't mean everybody's going to achieve it. But what he lays in your heart is possible, is achievable. You can go for it. You can link up to it with faith, and you can pursue it with all of your heart because God's will is always possible. Again, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Can I have the worship team come back up as we get ready to close? Here's what I want you to understand. Jesus died on the cross He set us free. He died on the cross for our sins. He set us free. He didn't set us free just so we could go back into slavery. He didn't set us free just so we could go back to the old way. He didn't set us free just to go back to the law. He didn't set us free just to put a lid on our life. He set us free so that we could reimagine our life through faith in what life is like in the kingdom of God. So can we just close our eyes for just a moment and just give some space for the Holy Spirit? And just ask God, God, what would my life look like if the tracks were changed that I'm running on? What would my life look like if, if I actually walked in your ability and your freedom? What would my life look like if I ripped off some of this lid? Some of you, it's, it's going to be a relational lid that you've got to lift. It's going to be an offense that you've got to lift. For others of you, it's going to be a theological lid that you've got to lift. Because you've put God in a box, you've acted like, you know, you've, you've got some bad theology somewhere, and, and it was well-meaning, but, but it's really locked you into a certain way of thinking, and it's locked you into a God of really the impossible instead of God, a God, a God that's not possible instead of a God of the impossible. And so right now, Holy Spirit, we just give you space. And we ask you right now, What would our life look like if the lid came off, if the mold was broken, if the current mold of the world or the current mold of the eyes of other people, what they think I ought to look like was broken off and I could walk in true freedom? Some of you might see, begin to see things right now through the eye of faith. Many of you are probably going to not be able to even put your finger on it, but you'll feel something different. And the reason I say that is because the way the Bible describes it is kind of an aroma about us. And you, you might even be able to sense what that next level will be like. You might even be able to just kind of step into there just briefly by faith and be able to imagine what life is like with no lid and freedom. So, Lord, I just declare over these people, I declare freedom. And I just declare your word over us tonight. That it's for freedom that we've been set free. 
And any limitation that's been put there, that we've put there or we've allowed others to put there, we know that that's not honoring to you. And so we rip that off right now. We repent of that right now. And Lord, I ask right now for a, a fresh, fresh eyes, a fresh culture around us, a fresh aroma about us. That the believer on the inside of us, that, that part of us that believes, would expand right now. The capacity to be able to see who you've made us to be. The capacity to be able to step into by faith what you've called us to walk into would expand right now. And I just declare that the kingdom of God is exploding on the inside of people right now. It's lighting up every single part right now. There will be no cavity of darkness, no cavity of limitation, no shadow where, where anything tries to hide and tries to grow in the dark. Let freedom come in Jesus' name. Let's stand and let's worship.